the Future of Field Service podcast. I'm your host, Sarah Nicastro. Every year we do a special episode of the podcast around International Women's Day, uh, and we're doing the same today. Um, The theme of this year's International Women's Day is Break the Bias. Uh, I'm excited to be welcomed today by Octavia Gorodima, who is a career coach, founder of 2010 Agency, uh, where she's coached leaders at renowned companies you're all familiar with, including Google, American Airlines, uh, Nike, General Motors, etc., and also author of the new book, uh, Prep, Push, Pivot, Essential Career Strategies for Underrepresented Women. Octavia, thanks for being here with me today. Oh, thank you, Sarah. I'm happy to be here. So before we get into the conversation, um, tell our listeners a bit about yourself and your journey. Oh, well, thank you for that warm welcome. And yes, I'm a career coach. Um, I started my company, 2010 Agency, because I'm really passionate about helping others to do their best work. Um, And as a Black woman, as I was starting my career, which began in England um, before I moved um, to the United States. I've been in, here in Los Angeles for, I think, 16 years now. Um, I just started to see that there were just so many barriers to advancement. Um, and I'm really passionate about opening doors and making sure others have the opportunity to do their best work. And it was actually when I worked myself with a coach for the very first time, that I really had a light bulb moment and made a pivot of my own um, and trained to become a coach. Um, And the work that I do is working with corporations, such as some of the larger companies that you referenced, and also individuals to, with companies, help them retain talent, Mm -hmm. um, with individuals to find strategies to position yourself for promotion, or to bounce back from losing a job or navigate a career break. But I recognize most people don't have the ability to work with a coach, Sarah. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I discovered coaching when I was already, you know, maybe 15 years into my career. Um, most of the individuals I work with, my team and I, we're the first coach <laughs> they've ever encountered in their career. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, I realized there's a huge gap there. And so I wanted to write a book that would help underrepresented women navigate some of those really important and often challenging moments, especially if you don't have someone that you can work with Mm -hmm. one-on-one. And so my book was released here in the United States um, in the new year, and it will be released in the United Kingdom on International Women's Day. (laughs) Nice. Awesome. Um, so uh, I'm I'm glad we're we're here to have this conversation. I think it's um it's really cool that you focus on helping on both sides. So helping businesses understand some of the ways that they may need to evolve or make changes, improvements, and then also you know helping to inspire um, individuals as well. Um, so uh, one question I, I have is, you know, you mentioned the barriers when you started your career. Okay. Yes. Um, how, how much progress do you feel we've made? Um, it's not just actually the barriers when starting the career. It's actually as you're growing and developing in your career. And, you know, the data speaks for itself, mm-hmm. you know, the pay gap persists. Before the pandemic, it was predicted it might take a century, Sarah, to close the pay gap. That's beyond my lifetime, your lifetime, my children's lifetime. Mm -hmm. Women of colour continue to be the most underrepresented group in the corporate pipeline, almost regardless of industry sectors. Mm -hmm. Data shows it. I'm really nervous and scared (laughs) about what the data will show as we look back on what's happening right now. We've already started to see studies that show women are being impacted severely when it comes to unemployment and leaving the workforce um, as a result of everything we've navigated and are still navigating through the pandemic. It's a really challenging and difficult time. 
Mm -hmm. um, and there's a lot of systemic issues <laughs> mm -hmm. that are contributing to the challenges that women face. Um, as a coach, some of the work that I'm proudest of is the work that I've done during this pandemic in terms of supporting individuals in some of the most unprecedented and challenging times. Mm -hmm. There's still so much work to be done. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I think, um, you know, this year's conversation just feels especially important because we, you know, we've seen the impact that COVID had um, and, and how it's amplified uh, for women, you know, and I just, you know, I've been fortunate enough, privileged enough to, um, you know, continue working this entire time. I have uh, two small children, um, but I have help. And, you know, I haven't had to sacrifice um, my career, but I just, I feel so deeply for those that have been in that position. Um, and, and so I think, you know, we're going to talk a little bit later about what are some of the things that companies can do to help get those women, women back into the workforce, you know, when they're ready. Um, I asked you about progress because, um, you know, we've, we've had a number of these conversations. Um, one every year, the podcast has been around for International Women's Day, but also, you know, sometimes we, we feature, you know, women in field service, women in tech, women in, you know, STEM. Um, and I have gotten feedback sometimes that, um, you know, if things aren't going to get better, if you keep calling it out that way, you know, it shouldn't be women in, or, you know, there shouldn't be, it shouldn't be um, kind of categorized that way, you know, and, um, the first time I got that feedback, I really thought long and hard about it because I, I try to be very careful about, you know, just reflecting on my own um, practices and making sure that I'm not, you know, doing something with good intent that is having the opposite yes. impact. Um, but I think the reality is, you know, there's still so much work to be done. And yes. I think that until it doesn't need to be called out, Yes. then we keep calling it out, right? Because yes, I don't absolutely. know how else we we talk about it. So yeah, um, yeah. so uh, I'm glad to, to be here doing that today. So as I mentioned in the intro, um, the theme of this year's International Women's Day is break the bias. Yes. Um, and so I wanted to start by talking about, you know, what are some of the biases that you feel are playing a major role in still holding women back today? Um, well, the, there's so many. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, you know, not every woman's experience in the workplace is the same as anyone else's. Um, but the data just shows when you, when, you, when you look at the most senior levels of almost anything, any company in any industry, the representation isn't there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> The representation isn't there. Um, when you look at what women are earning, it's not at parity with men when you look at the data. So there are, we, we've had legislation that's mm -hmm. been put in place to address these things. And even those things still don't translate. Mm -hmm. so, so those things are still there. And then as a coach, I have a unique glimpse into what actually happens in someone's career. Mm -hmm. So what happens after they are hired or as they are promoted and then after they are promoted and even senior leaders and the things that happen day in and day out, a lot of, no one else might ever know. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of um, biases or experiences that can be invisible even to somebody else who works alongside you or is sat in the same meeting as you or is on a Zoom with you. Mm -hmm. um, it can be a very personal experience mm -hmm. that not only is sometimes difficult to identify, but can be very difficult to talk about. Mm -hmm. Very difficult. Sometimes you don't even know if you've not been invited to a meeting that you should be mm -hmm. or if you've not been considered for a project or how do you know that <laughs> in that right. moment as well 
Um, and so this is what makes it even harder. And that's why we often then look at the studies and we look, well, how many women are there? And there's two black female CEOs in the Fortune 500. You know, we look at we look at figures like that because those are the indicators that we have. But the actual realities of what's happening day in, day out are invisible and nobody sees. Mm -hmm. And when you're building your career, what I often see as a coach is there comes a point. It's not the same point for everyone where you hit a ceiling. Mm -hmm. You might not see that ceiling coming. You might not even realize you've hit it for a while until you're actually reflecting and you're perhaps looking or maybe looking at your peers or you're comparing or you have a conversation and you suddenly realize, oh my goodness, that person's earning how much? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because it's not always immediately apparent to you. Mm -hmm. And this is what makes it even harder. And you mentioned you have children, Sarah. I have children too. And it wasn't until a few, maybe five years into parenthood that I realized, oh my goodness, a lot of these things are not my fault. Mm -hmm. I didn't make a mistake in terms of, you know, what I was doing. It's just that the systems are not set up to support working mothers in many cases in the way that they should be. Mm -hmm. um, and that can be a very difficult thing when you're navigating this because you don't know. <laughs> right. You yeah. don't know. Yeah, I've shared um, a number of my own experiences, um, you know, as someone who, um, you know, wanted to be a mom and have a career. And, you know, some of the um, things that have worked against me, some of the comments that have been made and, and are still made all the time, you know, and, um, you know, you mentioned some of the, the systemic issues earlier. And I think that, you know, the reality is there are still very real gender norms and belief systems around that in place that are kind of so not only deeply rooted, but multi-layered that it, to your point, can be really hard to to point all of those things out. I mean, I feel like my husband and I have a pretty egalitarian marriage, and it still is is uh, influenced by all of those things, you know, um, and and the expectations and all of that. So, um, yeah. Now, when you think about the theme of this year's International Women's Day, break the bias. So. I, I know there are a lot and they can be yes. hard to sort of identify. Are there any that come to mind that you think, you know, people need to be particularly aware of or focused on? That's a really hard question to answer because, you know, the, 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 there are so many layers to that. Um, and I think I would like people just to, regardless of their own gender and background, but to 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 really perhaps ask that question of themselves. Mm -hmm. um, and where can they support other women? Where can we as women support other women? Mm -hmm. Where can we pay it forward? Mm -hmm. um, what are some of the things that we can do mm -hmm. that can help support and amplify? Because I very much believe that these conversations continue, need to be had beyond <laughs> March 8th and beyond Women's History Month. Uh, it, it, they just need to be ongoing. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that would be the challenge that I have. Often, often I sometimes go into companies and work across the board, um, mm -hmm. not just with women, um, not just with men, um, not just with individuals who are being coached, but with senior leadership as well to really think about how to set up diverse talent and underrepresented talent um, and your female employees for success in the long term. Mm -hmm. In the long term. <laughs> um, because, because that's what matters, because it's not just about hiring women. It's about advancing women mm -hmm. and supporting women. Yeah. Um, throughout <laughs> our entire careers mm -hmm. um, so yes there's, there's a lot to do <laughs> yeah so besides conversations like this um what 
I mean, if, if you were going into work with an organization mm-hmm. um, and, and speaking with them on, you know, how do we break these biases and stereotypes in a way that allows us to make more progress? Um, what, what does that look like? I mean, what are some of the things that, that organizations should be doing? Yeah, I think visibility and advocacy really matters. Mm -hmm. Um, Be invested, identify opportunities to support women with their professional goals. As a coach, I see the women that are thriving in terms of the women I work directly with, the ones that have sponsors at their organizations. So it's not just about providing what's needed for us to do our best work, but being there to support when we make mistakes and to show and nurture and amplify and be a resource. Um, You know, often as we progress, there are fewer and fewer role models we may have. (laughs) And so it's really important that it's not just having someone to, to look to, but someone who is invested in your success. If you as a leader, whatever level of leadership you are, always be mindful about who is on your team or who is in your organization and the the visibility of those individuals and those opportunities for those individuals Mm -hmm. and what you can do to make a difference. Mm -hmm. Because those opportunities can change someone's whole career, mm-hmm. whether it's um, a stretch assignment or even a meeting that you're part of or a conversation or a mentorship or just understanding what might come next or what might there might be for you mm-hmm. can really change someone's perspective. The, 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 the mentors that I have had and continue to have are, have been transformative for me. Mm-hmm. Um, And so I think it's having that intent, which can be sometimes hard to measure. (laughs) Um, It's not something that's always immediately tangible. Um, So it takes um, a lot of organizations are trying to make those culture shifts to to have these systems and to to nurture pipelines of talent and not lose women um, Mm -hmm. as we progress. So I think that is very, very important. Yeah. Makes sense. You mentioned earlier that women of color are the most underrepresented group in the corporate pipeline. Yes. Um, what is your view on how that changes? So in my book, I, I think I quoted a study from Working Mother Media that talked about 46%, only 46% of underrepresented women in their study had attended a meeting with senior executives in the last two years compared to 63% of white men. Mm -hmm. Um, So advocacy, visibility, mentorship, coaching, professional development, it all matters. A lot of companies are trying really, really hard to diversify their recruiting processes Mm -hmm. and they're um, bringing it up, but it's, it's retaining those individuals. Um, that, that, that is just so key. That is so key. And that takes time. Mm -hmm. That takes time. Um, being an advocate also involves being a good listener Mm -hmm. as well, providing space to ask people, um, questions and be responsive to what you hear. Um, and so there are some companies that I've seen, seen reports on who are actually, especially at the start of this year, um, who are actually saying we're making a real stake here and we're tying compensation for executives to hitting certain goals and targets Mm -hmm. long-term. This is important to us. Mm -hmm. And if we succeed, there's, you know, this is, these are the measures by, by which we will, Mm -hmm. Um, but it takes time. Um, And so when you as an individual are navigating your career. You can't control all of these environments that are around you. And so the book that I wrote, Prep, Push, Pivot, I really wanted to 
support women who are navigating this. And also, if you are a leader who has underrepresented women on your team, read the book and, and it gives you a perspective on perhaps some of the questions and challenges that we are considering that might not have been front of mind for you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and awareness and understanding, um, mm-hmm. I think, is really important. Okay. So um, when it comes to retaining diverse talent yes. um, and some of the, you know, considerations that are maybe unique to women, um, what what do you feel like is, you know, some of the most important things? Like what, what are some of the, um, you know, needs that, companies need to accommodate or address to be able to retain and develop more, uh, more women? Um, I think providing the visibility that I talked about too, and also those stretch assignments and opportunities, you know, there've been countless reports that talk about how when we're looking at roles, whether that's for promotion or new roles, women tend to look at all of the job description and kind of see where we align. And if we align with, you know, 80 or 90% of it, yes, we can do that role. In comparison, more often than not, men will just put their names forward regardless. And I've seen that play out in my own household. I was talking to my husband about an opportunity a female friend of mine was considering, but she was a little concerned about some components of the job description. And my husband said to me, who reads job descriptions? (laughs) If I want a job go for it yeah <laughs> so he, said, he said if I read the job description I won't be able to do half the things on there so mm-hmm. I, don't, I don't want to pay attention to those things and so identifying when you see potential nurturing that potential and advance and, and creating conversations and opportunities and exposure to get mm-hmm. that pipeline of women um, to feel supported and amplified and ready and mentored um, because that is so key. When we are breaking barriers of our own, that mm-hmm. next, the next opportunity, even the one that we can't see yet, mm-hmm. are the ones where we want senior leaders to be identifying, highlighting, nurturing for those things. Yeah, yeah. It's, that's what's so important. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, providing space to grow, Mm -hmm. whether you're at the start, middle, or more senior in your career. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I guess what I'm trying to do in my mind is is take some of these points that um, are important, but they're also fairly broad, right? Like when we talk about create awareness and advocate, I mean, yes, but if I'm listening to this and those things aren't intuitive to me, then what does that look like? Right. And, and what I'm thinking about is sort of three areas um, at least that come to mind. One is, is company culture. Right. And so in a few ways, number one, I mean, there are companies for which this is genuinely important and a, authentic objective. And then there are companies who have these initiatives simply because they have to. Um, So, but then I would also say related to company culture is, um, you know, the environment that is created to uncover and acknowledge biases, to speak up and speak out, to, um, you know, have leaders lead by example in terms of um, making the culture, you know, working woman friendly, working mom friendly, right? Like, I don't think that a lot of working moms can succeed in a certain type of ultra rigid culture that is a little bit more outdated. The second thing I think of is you know, programs or systems, right? So, you know, some of the the things that we've talked about, um, you know, starting with awareness, but also, you know, mentorships and career development paths, you know, those are all things that companies should be focused on building out so that it isn't, um, you know, 
leaders who who want to play a role in this aren't, you know, trying to create the wheel every time, right? Like there's yes. sort of a, a process and a, a system to help um, accomplish these goals. And then I think the third is leadership enablement, right? Because there are leaders for whom this will be sort of a personal goal or commitment, um, yes. but there are those that it's not, you know, so you mentioned perhaps they're incentivized to play a role in this. Um, you know, the other thing is perhaps they are trained or coached in their own right to, you know, be better adept at recognizing their own biases and, you know, examining kind of, you know, um, what do their teams look like and what does that mean? And, you know, things like that. Um, I don't know. Those are kind of the three yeah. things that, that and the came strat- to mind. The strategy is very dependent on the size of your organization and, mm-hmm. and um, the, you know, the demographics of your people and your goals. You know, large organizations have employee resource groups and networks, which are mm-hmm. great. But then you also have to think about what is the remit of those organizations? How are they funded? How are you? Often the people that are leading those organizations are doing two jobs. They're, mm-hmm. they're doing their day job and they're also, you know, creating some kind of mechanism for other employees which is so powerful but how is that recognized how is that mm-hmm. supported in the long term are you using that? that's a really fantastic incubator to also listen are you asking questions in those groups that could help you and give you insights that you wouldn't hear otherwise are you providing safe spaces for sharing mm-hmm. um, you might have you know company meetings or town hall meetings where you report out how are you listening back how are you mm-hmm. there, there were lots of different considerations um for organizations um, but if you if you are making an effort to hire, you want to keep your talent. Mm-hmm. Um, you you want to find opportunities to you know the the the, the payoffs for your business and your organization will just continue. You know, mm-hmm. and so you, you you want to make those investments and provide advocacy and mentoring and supporting and sponsorship, um, and also hold space to listen to mm-hmm. the people that are already part of your culture and your organization and hear what they might need. To your point. Um, um, because everyone, those voices can be so valuable and not everyone perhaps has the opportunity to share in that way when we're at mm-hmm. work. So yeah. creating spaces yeah. and opportunities to do that. That's a good point. I mean, if there's an organization that, you know, hasn't made as much effort as they want um, in this area, you know, start by creating a focus group of your women employees and ask them what they think honestly about the experience and what could be better. And, you know, that's, that's a good point. Um, so we, we talked a little bit earlier about the fact that, um, you know, women were impacted significantly more than men, um, by COVID when it comes to, uh, loss of work and, and having to leave their careers. Um, do you have any thoughts on, on how we can best support women's re-entry into the workplace yeah um we the, the numbers that came out of some of the initial studies at the st- um after the first year of the pandemic w- were just horrifying mm-hmm. um and as i mentioned at the start of our conversation i i hope it's not the case but could have the potential to set women back for decades when you look mm-hmm. at the ramifications of what that means in terms of not just loss of earning capacity, but just what it takes to rebuild and restart restart your career. Um, so setting the women that you are hiring up for success, as we've talked about, is really important. Um, listening to what might be needed in terms of maybe flexible schedules or, or, or roles and responsibilities in terms of uh, uh, locations. But uh, uh, I think above and beyond that, looking for the long term in terms of how to continue to advance women um, and that next cycle and that next generation and continue to pay it forward because it's above and beyond just this moment right now. Um, the, the pay gap, which we talked about at the start of our conversation, was already going to take decades mm-hmm. and decades to close. So really look at your compensation practices and make sure that you're paying you know, you, you are equitable um, mm-hmm. in terms of 
how you compensate your employees is so important. Not, not all women are caregivers, but for those are who are, um, I do hope, I do hope, that may be the one silver lining coming out of everything that we have been through and are going through this pandemic, that employers that will be much more aware mm-hmm. of what it takes to be a working parent mm-hmm. yeah. <laughs> today. <laughs> yeah. Um, because that has been and will continue to be a challenge. Mm-hmm. Um, but so that we can we can keep women in the workforce for as long as possible. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's, uh, I wish I, um, I should have thought to, to write this down and I didn't. So I don't remember any of the, the sort of names of the organizations to reference, but I have seen some different programs created to help with this effort. You know, people that are, yes. you know, strategically looking for opportunities to offer, you know, really flexible um, yes, and positions and re-entry into and the hours, workplace. right. Yes. So that, you know, if, if, there are women who left that can't just come back maybe in yes. the manner they did before. What are some alternatives? Um, the other yeah, thing I, that, that, sorry, I, I thought was really important was, um, uh, I don't know if it was an article or, or a podcast, but it was um, around, you know, looking differently um, in this situation, but really just in general about gaps on resumes, you know, yes. and not using that as something that is, you know, negatively perceived. Um, yes. Sorry, what were you going to say? Yeah, I was going to say, yes, I, I just received an email, I think yesterday, there are a lot of companies who have um, re-entry to work mm-hmm. programs where they're specifically recruiting and from large companies like Wells Fargo to Facebook mm-hmm. to s- smaller companies too, um, and really targeting women who have taken a break, maybe not just because of the pandemic, but have taken a break in, in their careers. Yeah. And yes, to your point about gaps in resumes, I know often as employees, we're looking to minimize risk. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, um, but, you know, I can attest as a working parent, I have done my best work <laughs> ever <laughs> since becoming a parent. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, women have so much to bring mm-hmm. um, and there should not be... Um, a, a gap in a resume is not a, a non-negotiable. This is what I say to um, women that I coach who are concerned about this. I talk about mm-hmm. it in my book too. You can, you can do this role. Yeah. Um, your, your, your skills and your acumen remains regardless. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think the pandemic also perhaps has made that more aware that there is no one perfect way to navigate anyone's career and we and we have to we have to as a whole support um, people who've who stepped away from the workforce for whatever reason mm-hmm. um so that we can get our economies back and so we can continue to thrive um and so yes i i hope i hope <laughs> the silver lining will be that there's been a lot of lessons that have been learned in a very short and very pronounced space of time mm-hmm. um and i hope that we can find ways to support women who are looking to re-enter and rebuild, whether it's now or in the future. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think the other thing is, um, you know, I've read a number of different uh, articles and and studies looking at, you know, this isn't applicable to every single type of role, understandably, but I mean, looking at the need to sort of evolve the culture around, um, you know, how we assess value, right? So rather, and this I think was exacerbated by COVID when we had so many people working remote, you know, it becomes less about, okay, how many hours, minutes, seconds is your butt in a seat at a desk versus what is your contribution toward the objectives? And I think that, um, you know, I think that's the way it should be. Um, But I think this situation maybe has helped, you know, employers that were kind of hanging on to that need for control to recognize that, you know, if you, if you focus on creating an environment in which your talent can thrive, they will most times step up to the challenge. You know, I mean, people, care and want to do well generally. Right. So, um, it goes back to kind of that cultural part as well. Um, so, okay. Um, so you, you, you talk in your book about how fear is 
a very big challenge for women when it comes to their careers. Um, and, and you mentioned earlier, you know, the example of, um, you know, your husband saying, I don't even read job descriptions. I just apply. (laughs) Whereas, you know, um, sometimes, a a woman or a particular personality would kind of overanalyze every single characteristic. Um, so, why do you think fear is so prevalent and and what advice can you share? Um, I think often there's fear of making a mistake. Mm-hmm. Fear of dropping a ball, fear of just not, not delivering. Mm-hmm. Um, and I see that manifest constantly (laughs) Um, and it's not about level of seniority Um, and so I think it's really really important to know that building your career is yes the most personal and valuable investment you'll ever make but also know you have to give yourself permission to fail sometimes that doesn't mean you won't you know doesn't mean you want to set out to fail that's how you learn as you go. Mm-hmm. I think it's so important. Um, you know, I I always have a smile when you, I, I see, you know, you, you see these very senior executives who get fired and bounce back better. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and you, you, if you really look at it, you see people make mistakes at a very senior level. Mm-hmm. And it's not necessarily a career ender. Really keep pushing and keep striving and don't be afraid of making a mistake. Mm-hmm. Don't don't feel you have to do everything perfectly. Mm-hmm. Um, you th- we have to learn and we have to grow. And I think it's very important if anyone is mentoring someone else to be really transparent about the mistakes that you have made, mm-hmm. what you learned from those, how you navigated those. Mm-hmm. It's really important thing to do. Mm-hmm. And to yeah. give space for that. And also you as an individual trust that even if you do make a misstep, you'll learn from it and you'll keep moving forward. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think another area where fear plays um, such a big role in all of this for everyone is fear of speaking up. You know, I mm-hmm. think that when it comes to this, this idea of, of breaking the bias, you know, like you said, so much of, of the cumulative effect of why women are not equal, um, you know, to men in the workplace today is, is those little things, you know, I mean, it's, it's the daily, uh, you know, I forgot to put you on the meeting invite or gaslighting or, you know, all sorts of things. And, Every day, um, people see that happen, you know, and it's really easy to be fearful that, you know, if it's a leader that's doing that, oh, well, I can't say something because they're my superior or I don't want to start anything or let me just stay in my lane. And, you know, the reality is, um, we all play a part in uh, making the progress we want to make. And yes, it can be very uncomfortable to have hard conversations. Um, I can, you know, think back on times where I avoided them myself, but you, you know, better, you do better. Right. And um, I think that's another area where, you know, people need to consider, you know, stepping outside of their comfort zone and, and helping, um, keep the, the progress moving by addressing things like that when they see them, you know? And yes, I agree. So, and, and everything you say is valid. It, it can be very difficult mm-hmm. in that moment. If there is someone more senior than you to use your voice in that way. And I've been in that situation, you know, be, before I had my coaching company, I was employed and I remember having to say to the CEO of the company where I worked, is there a reason why I wasn't included in that meeting? Mm -hmm. I feel I should have been there and I would have liked to have been there. And this Mm -hmm. is the reason why. And I did end up 
receiving an apology. <laughs> but that wasn't in the immediate reaction. It was, you know, it, it, it came much later. So you you don't know how, what the response will be. But ideally, your employer wants employees who are there to add value and to solve problems and to help do things better. Yeah. And to help do things better. And so if you are using your voice to show where you will add value or where things could be different or where things could be better, then you need to observe and then see what happens next. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right, Octavia. So um, any final thoughts, words of wisdom, um, you know, what do you hope that people take away from this discussion? Um. It's an ethos that underpins everything that I do and that I open my book, Prep, Push, Pivot with, which is knowing your worth matters, especially in the moments where your worth is not being reflected back at you. Mm -hmm. I think that is really important. And for employers, recognize the worth (laughs) of what women on your team and your future female hires will bring to the table Mm -hmm. and it's of course your worth is represented by what you earn but it's more than just that it's what you need to do your best work and what you need to thrive and as individuals what are the non-negotiables for us in our career and making sure that we are building careers that align with our goals and our values Mm -hmm. yeah I have um a special shirt on today I don't know if you can see it it says carry as you climb Oh, I love um, that. And, uh, you know, it goes back to the point you made earlier, which is, you know, as women, we have an obligation to help one another as yes. well, right? Um, we, you know, yes, all of the, um, you know, white men in senior leadership positions need to really reflect on what their teams and organization looks like and how, you know, genuine they are about their desire to to really progress uh, related to this. But, um, you know, until we are at a point where these conversations become less necessary, you know, we really have to um, to help each other out and yes. support one another, speak up on one another's behalves, um, you know, uh, just really advocate for one another, lift each other up, um, you know, all of those things. So paying it forward really matters. And it can be also in ways where we're not actually using our voice in front of others, but in terms of suggesting opportunities mm-hmm. or mm-hmm. resources to others. Yeah. Um and, and so yeah, it can be in small ways or it can be in really impactful ways. Um, mm-hmm. yeah, paying it forward is so important. Yeah, I think it's um, you know, there there's a real thing of particularly because women are still at a disadvantage in the workplace. I think, you know, there can be a tendency toward the scarcity mindset, you know, and well, if I help her, then I will somehow disadvantage myself. Um, And, you know, we, we just have to move beyond that. I mean, we all need to be helping uh, one another and, and you're never going to be, you know, disadvantaged by championing someone else. Um, and, you know, so. Absolutely. Good. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. <laughs> All right. Tell folks where they can find uh, pres- prep, oh goodness, prep, <laughs> push, pivot. Uh, where can they find the book? So prep, push, pivot is available wherever you love to buy books. So you'll be able to find it at your local bookstore or at your favorite online book retailer. And you can also go to my website, OctaviaGorodima.com if you need more information. Excellent. All right, Octavia, thank you so much for joining me today. I appreciate it. Oh, thank you, Sarah. It's great to be here. You can find more by visiting us at futureoffieldservice.com. You can also find us on LinkedIn as well as Twitter at the Future of FS. The Future of Field Service podcast is published in partnership with IFS. You can learn more at ifs.com. As always, thank you for listening.